welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Our podcasts are made possible in part by a grant from the Thomas Job Fund. Greetings, I'm Amy Biancoli, family editor here, and today I'll be speaking with James Greenblatt. He's an innovator and longtime authority in the fields of integrative medicine and functional psychiatry, focusing on nutrition and other natural modes of treatment for people in distress, including teens with eating disorders and children and adults diagnosed with ADHD. He's the author of eight books, most recently on antidepressant withdrawal, and founder of the website psychiatryredefined.org where he works to educate professionals on the science and practice of functional, integrative, and metabolic psychiatry. Greenblatt serves as Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Medical Services at Walden Behavioral Care, which is based in Massachusetts. He teaches at the Tufts University School of Medicine and the Dartmouth College School of Medicine as well. Dr. Greenblatt, welcome. Glad to have you here today. Thank you, Amy. It's good to be with you. I have a lot of questions today because you've done so much interesting work, but for a start, for our listeners, could you define functional medicine and integrative psychiatry? Um, And how do those approaches differ from conventional psychiatry? What do people need to know going into this conversation about what you do and how it differs? Uh, Good start. I mean, so we can have three three buckets here. Conventional psychiatry, we're all quite aware of, is pretty much a symptomatic-based polypharmacy treatment model. We have one tool, and it's a medicine for a symptom. The second, third, and fourth medicine, I think we're all aware of that and the limitations of that. We, We throw in psychotherapy, but the model is medications. Integrative medicine, which has gained steam over the last 30 years, includes the terms like mindfulness and yoga and lifestyle and exercise and diet, all these terms that you know the consumers had to push forward and, and finally have been embraced by our medical establishment. And that's great news. We have mindfulness trainings at Harvard and Stanford, and we have lifestyle fellowships for doctors. But in my 30 years of practice, that hasn't been enough to make a dent in the, I believe, the the tragedy of our current treatment model in psychiatry. And that's where the term functional medicine comes in. And functional medicine looks at the root cause. It looks at that connection between genetic vulnerability and environmental stresses or deficiencies or toxins and it's based on objective testing. So we look for nutritional deficiencies, we look at the gut, we look at genes. So if we add a traditional model, if we add an integrative model with a functional model, I believe, in my experience, it's a recipe for dramatically improved outcomes. So you used a term just now, the root cause. Um, So could you describe a little bit uh, what you do to determine that, uh, because of course, what's missing from psychiatric diagnosis and treatment is is the test. You know, like you get a, 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 everybody always in the main the mainstream narr- narrative. Everybody's always comparing uh, psychiatric disorders with, say, uh, someone with diabetes. But with diabetes, you get a blood test to determine <laughs> that that you need insulin. Um, so, what is is there something specific in your modalities, what you do, that, again, differs from the original approach? How do you determine that, that root cause that you're talking about? This is both the exciting part and, and the challenging part, because the, the workup that we would do on a patient in a functional psychiatry approach might look at 250 biomarkers. And, and the list is, is very long, but we could just take, you know, B12 deficiency. How many psychiatrists are routinely looking at B12 deficiency? And we know it contributes to depression, anxiety. We've seen it contribute to psychosis and a whole host of other mental health problems. 
We could do vitamin D deficiency. Some of the most common um, tests that, that we look at is actually celiac disease as a root cause. I can't tell you over the years as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, how many kids have walked in the office with everything from anxiety to anorexia nervosa, that when celiac disease was diagnosed and treated, the nutritional deficiencies repleted, those psychiatric symptoms disappeared. So it's not one test. It's looking at, you know, we start all our trainings with, you know, teaching psychiatrists, we have a neck, right? What happens in the body affects our brain. The interesting thing to me too, is that you're talking about genetic causes or, or the, the idea of something being in, in, an inheritable tendency, an inheritable um, predisposition to some um, uh, nutritional deficiency. And how, again, how is that different from the biomedical model, which says, uh, you know, that chemical imbalance, quote unquote, that you have, uh, there, there's a genetic there's a genetic cause for that. And you could inherit depression from uh, your parents, your grandparents. Um, and of course, I'm sure you're aware that Madden America, of course, trains a very uh, critical lens on that view, that kind of biomedical, uh, so-called chemical imbalance view that's uh, regarded as inheritable. Um, and, and so once again, I'm just really curious to hear what is the difference. And that's one thing that really in general, really interests me about your work are those differences between what you do and what usual psychiatric practice does. Sure. I mean, I mean, the lens that the Madden America has been, and, and Bob uh, Whitaker has been kind of focused on is, you know, helping everyone understand the limitations of such a simple model. So our model is not depression is genetic. Our model is for individual A, the genetics has to do with their metabolism of a nutrient called folate. So we look at a gene that metabolizes folate. For the next person, the genetics is how they absorb vitamin B12. The next person happens to be the autoimmune disorder, celiac disease. So there's powerful genetics, and we can't deny that. But our traditional approach is just depressed, antidepressant. If you're sad, we'll give you an anti-sad pill. And Madden America has exposed the, the profound limitations around that model. And we've just kind of expanded a, a deeper dive into why, what's going on. And it's different for everyone suffering the same illnesses. I mean, there are certainly similarities, and that's part of our teaching. But the core concept in functional medicine is biochemical individuality. Everyone's different. And we have to appreciate that and, and look for it with objective tests. So is this part of the whole body approach? Instead of taking a close look at one piece of a person's biology or mind or emotions or social setting or anything or history or genetic history, family history, instead of just looking at one piece of that, looking at the whole picture, is that part of it? Uh, that That's it, Amy. I mean, that's pretty much if, if we can... Um, do a better job from taking three generation family histories, looking at all the parts of what makes us human from relationships to our diet. Absolutely. We would have better outcomes for our kids and adults with mental illness. And just hearing you say that, it just seems so obvious. And whenever I, I have a, a conversation like this with somebody or I, or I read, uh, you know, an article uh, making a similar argument, I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> it just like from a human standpoint, it just seems really obvious or it should be. I mean, it's so obvious that that's, for me, sometimes that is both the, the optimism, the excitement, but also the anger and rage. I mean, some of the, this information has been embedded in our research for 30 years and our medical community and our therapeutic um, community has just ignored it. Or what's happening now, which is even more frustrating, we're acknowledging it, but not doing anything about it. Like, like sleep, sleep in adolescence. We know sleep increases risk for depression and suicide. And we know kids aren't sleeping. 
uh, enough. And we know the mechanisms of what happens in terms of all these inflammatory markers. So we know all that stuff and everybody admits it, but we're not integrated into how we're treating these kids in emergency rooms after the second suicide attempt, but the information and science is there. So how did you come to this different take on psychiatry? Um, If you could tell us a little bit about your backstory. Um, From what I've read, you started out 35 years ago or so in a conventional child psychiatry practice. Is that right? Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back a little further because I kind of walked into medical school thinking I was going to cure the world with, you know, brown rice and kale. So I originally, you know, was interested in nutrition and, and mental health. And nine years later, medical school and child psychiatry, I came out as a child psychiatrist, which is the model is psychopharm and, um, and psychotherapy. And quickly in private practice, um, you know, I realized that the meds were Band-Aids. Sometimes they helped, sometimes they didn't, and really got back to my roots and have been studying and, and teaching uh, other doctors this uh, functional medicine model which, as you said, is obvious and and not that complicated. Did you ever, at some point early on in your career, when um, you first became a child psychiatrist, did you believe when you first started out? I'm just curious about your aha moment. Did you believe in psychiatric drugs as treatment for disease at some point? And then was there, I don't know, was there one case, one instance, or was it just a wave of kids that you saw and you just looked at them and thought, this isn't working? What, what was your turning point, your epiphany, if there was one? It really wasn't an epiphany because I still prescribe medications. And, and this is what I think has been hard and polarizing for communities that clearly have tried to you know, criticize or um, improve our psychiatric model, which I'm desperate of, for that improvement. But there's a role for psychiatric medications. If you've ever seen uh, someone who's psychotic or manic um, or watching an ADHD child who can't function and then functions well. So there's a role for medicine, and I still believe that, but it's certainly overprescribed, overused, and no one's looking for the root cause. So there are patients that I would see where they never have to take a medication, or my job is just helping them get off medications. There are other patients I've seen over the years where medications have truly been life-saving. And it, it just really is helping clinicians understand that difference. And our traditional model is really just, you know, focused on that one direction. So just to underscore this, this was uh, one of my questions. Uh, is it you're not anti-medicine? It just depends. From your perspective, it depends on the circumstances and the individual patient. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been uh, treating eating disorders on inpatient um, level of care, where they're all malnourished. So I get to talk about nutrition and malnutrition and prescribe supplements like zinc and fatty acids. So, but in that traditional psychiatric community, I've admitted patients uh, suicidal, manic, psychotic, and, and those patients can benefit from medications. What I differ with my colleagues is you're usually over-medicated, medicated too long, and the side effects are just ignored. So yes, I believe there's a place for psychiatric medications um, used judiciously short-term as we look at the root cause of the functional medicine model. How do you kind of make peace with the fact, and I'm really just curious to hear your take on it, as, as a psychiatrist who questions psychiatry but still uses the, the drugs for, as you were saying, with some patients who get short-term benefits, since you're so you're focused in most of your work on finding those root causes, um, not just the biological factors, but, but all, the, all the causes, since you're so focused on that, how is it different when you're when you're prescribing drugs that people don't really understand when they do work why they work and that the science is so unclear yeah the the important question is um has to, has to be discussed and i think that um i'm 100% um no we'll say 90% uh, you know, in, in agreement with, with the Mad in America narrative, I mean, the incredible writing and the articulate um, stories and questioning our current model. What has been frustrating for some of us 
in the, the functional integrative sphere is that Men America, the narrative hasn't offered the solutions. And, and that's what our focus has been on. How can we help these individuals who are emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually uh, tormented due to their mental illness? So my job as, as a child psychiatrist, an adult psychiatrist, as a human being, to offer the tools, one, first do no harm, and two, anything to be of benefit. So I, I'm looking to support a patient and a family. And I think the tools of integrative and functional medicine just offers a tremendous scientific-backed ab- ability to look at it. I mean, a- again, I mentioned some, whether it's uh, vitamin D in our minority populations that are very low or celiac disease or long COVID, we could talk about. Whatever the process is, we're investigating that and we're going to treat it. And in the, in the interim, if I need a medication for a week or two or a month to support that patient's journey towards health, then I believe there are some medicines that could be a benefit. So it's sort of, um, correct me if this is the wrong metaphor or analogy, but it's kind of like putting a cast on someone with a broken limb for, a, uh, for some weeks or months so they can move forward and go through PT eventually if they've had a, an injury, or is that too strained an analogy? No, that makes sense. Let me, let me give you two, two examples. So one is a 12-year-old um, girl who's been refusing to eat, uh, been in the medical hospital, children's hospital here locally, um, being fed by an NG tube, gets to our eating disorder facility, not eating, uh, starts to get malnourished, and I give this child, and it's, I probably can give you a thousand examples over 20 years of a tiny dose. If you know medications, we're talking about 1.25 milligrams of Zyprexa, Olanzapine, an antipsychotic. And I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of kids lose the rigidity and the delusions that are preventing them from eat, eating, and they start eating. And then we taper that medication, sometimes in weeks, sometimes in a month. That olanzapine was life-saving. And anorexia nervosa is the most lethal illness in all of psychiatry. So we, we have to do something. And the other example I always use, it was a, 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 a series of articles in the New York Times a number of years ago on mental illness in uh, West Africa. So at the time, if you were delusional, you would get chained to a tree. Your family would bring you a mat, they would put shackles on your leg, and they would bring you food. And there was an area. Um, and, and the story talked about um, a visiting nurse um, giving this woman uh, an injection of Haldol, a long-acting Haldol injection. And I think it was a 19-year-old girl. And it cured her delusions. She was unshackled from the, her tree. She went home to her family and... Um, got a monthly injection of Haldol. So how can anybody say that that is an evil, dangerous medication? Now, in our inpatient facilities, absolutely, our antipsychotics are overused and they cause side effects and diabetes and weight gain, and it is poorly monitored. It is a disaster. In general, are we talking about harm reduction um, in two senses? Um, we haven't, I haven't ha- asked you much so far about your work with psychiatry redefined. Um, but it really intrigued me when I looked at your website and, and your efforts to educate your colleagues, because it just struck me that you're, you're trying to get them to adjust their practices. And I wondered whether you sort of have a harm reduction mindset, actually about the practice of psychiatry, kind of getting people to adjust their thinking a little bit, change their practices a little bit. And whether or not that's actually sort of an equivalent of what you're describing right now uh, in, in terms of prescribing small, small doses of psychiatric drugs for patients who, who need it in some moment of crisis. Are, is, you're just trying to make things a little better? Is that, is that sort of the case? No, I, I think I'm, I'm going for the home run. I mean, I think the Psychiatry Redefined website 
has no medication trainings or it is 100% focused on a integrative and functional model. So again, I don't know how many people you know, have seen a, a, a nine-year-old um, hearing voices and seeing things and, and unable to function. But I'm confident that rather than multiple antipsychotics, that we can find the cause. And, um, and we've seen it. You know, I've seen undetectable you know, nutrient levels and, and serious uh, gut problems that we know can create psychosis. No, so psychiatry to find is focused on a completely new model looking for the home run, looking for the root cause. And if we can't find it, we, we do understand, it's not the training that we focus on, that there are some, certainly in my hospital work, that medicine is used. But psychiatry to find is really only focused on this functional model. Being in in the real traditional world of psychiatry, it's it's the only way I'm going to embrace my colleagues. Um, I certainly um, think there's a lot we could just throw away and start over. It's just not going to happen. So, uh, abs- absolutely, it um, for my traditional work in an inpatient hospital for serious mental illness, there is a concept of harm reduction uh, early on in treatment. And that what keeps me going in this field is as we train more doctors and they send us cases of, of, of complete remission of major psychiatric illness. And that doesn't happen with a medication model, which is just symptomatic based band-aids. So you you truly are talking about healing people, not just, okay, we're gonna write this prescription and you're gonna be on it the rest of your life because there's there's no cure for this whatever diagnosis you have. You're talking about, you're saying, yes. We can heal from these things. Can you give an example of that? Stanford now has a clinic called Metabolic Psychiatry, where they're looking at the ketogenic diet, dramatically changing the neurochemistry of the body that with uh, ketones fueling the brain, we've seen in their case studies with the reversal of psychosis, a binge eating disorder, depression, and helping people taper off medicines. So There's very good research actually around the globe um, on a ketogenic diet and looking at insulin resistance. Uh, We've seen, you know, infections, uh, strep infections or tick-borne disease like Lyme cause neuropsychiatric symptoms. And some of the most um, dramatic cases, um, you know, I've worked with is something that's ignored by both the integrative and traditional community is looking at uh, a simple marker like cholesterol. And there is a dramatic 30 plus year research uh, understanding the role of very low cholesterol with suicide risk and depression. And very low cholesterol is considered under 130 total cholesterol. So we, we've had kids admitted to an inpatient psychiatric unit for multiple suicide attempts. Usually the low cholesterol Kids are kind of violent, aggressive attempts. Um, and total cholesterols of 119. So the brain doesn't work well. So by treating this, we, we believe, is a genetic, physiological difference unrelated to dietary intake, we've been able to you know, stop these chronic depression and suicidal thoughts. So there's just, again, I mentioned hundreds of biomarkers that we can train our doctors to to look at to determine the root cause. You're saying there's actually a lot of science that shows uh, the dangers of having very, very low cholesterol, um, but people aren't aware of that. And, and this is, again, something that Madden America grapples with is that the science shows, for instance, the, um, the harms and um, deficiencies of, say, SSRIs, the potential harms and deficiencies, all the side effects, the suicidality, all of that associated with, with, um, with, with SSRIs and other psychiatric drugs, but that most people aren't aware of that because there's what science says, what research says, and then there's what the mainstream narrative says. So how do you, and I realize your work is, you're more concerned with altering, expanding, adjusting the narrative for your, your colleagues, but how do you change the wider narrative? Is it possible? 
Oh, and absolutely. I mean, the last book we wrote is a textbook on, you know, antidepressant withdrawal. And all of our presentations are on suicidal ideation on SSRIs. What I have found uh, working with our patients with eating disorders, when the SSRI uh, suicide risk came out, the black box warning, I was practicing adolescent psychiatry in a hospital, and I never saw suicidal ideation. Didn't make sense to me. And then 20 years ago, uh, I shifted to this eating disorder inpatient program. And I started seeing a lot of kids started an SSRI intense suicidal ideation. So I started understanding the connection between malnutrition and this this side effect. Why do some individuals get the suicidal ideation and some individuals don't? I mean, to me, that is one of the most profound questions. Why do some individuals have horrible withdrawal and some don't? So if we stop focusing on the med and start looking at the individual, the individual's biochemistry, we can answer some of those questions. So I clearly want to change the traditional narrative of informed consent around many of these medications, but I believe some of them can be used safely. I'm less of a fan of some of the of the SSRIs, you know, than some of the other medications in these unique situations. So you're saying some people might have a genetic predisposition for uh, withdrawal or, or side effects and they should be, informed consent would mean being told you might have this reaction, but you're saying, it, it again, it boils down to a genetic predisposition that some people have this reaction and some people don't. And I'm not sure it's genetic as much as I'm pretty comfortable. I could predict those individuals that are going to have severe withdrawal. By the, looking at these biomarkers, these are the individuals that have profound nutritional or metabolic problems. So we can predict who's going to have withdrawal problems. And that's been why I wrote the book. We treat you know, severe B12 deficiency, genetic variants of folate. If we treat all that first and then begin a slow taper of these medications, they often don't have these withdrawal symptoms. So you're saying whatever the, the 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 root cause well the root cause in the sense of as your nutritional deficiency or 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 something else that's going on and you're not saying that necessarily there's a, a genetic cause for it it's just if people are responding a certain way to a drug it's can be largely related to such vitamin these nutritional dis- deficiencies is that correct Yes. I mean, we know these medications disturb uh, serotonin metabolism. Um, we know about animal studies, people end up having lower levels of, of serotonin over time. So a, a very major disruption in neurophysiology. And, and then you pull that medicine away, you know, things uh, wreak havoc and, and the horrific stories about antidepressant withdrawal. But if we can look at, let's just take that celiac patient who's been malabsorbed you know, malabsorption nutrients like zinc and and tryptophan and folate and vitamin D. They didn't know they had celiac. They could never stop their antidepressant with severe symptoms. If we treat the celiac, if we replete those nutrients, they can safely taper off the medications without withdrawal. So that's the first, that's the first approach is looking at it and saying, okay, why what, what, or, or doing the tests that you're describing and saying, do you have these deficiencies? Do you have these, these causes that can be addressed before prescribing anything else? Yes. I find it silly. Both the, there's a, you know, lots of people, anti-psychiatry people, or even psychiatrists, everyone has these theory, okay, taper 5% a week or 25%. Everyone has these, these, these programs and none of it makes any medical sense. So someone walks into my office who's tried to taper and have had withdrawal and brain zaps and dysfunctional, I would tell them, do not taper your medicine for three months. Let's do these tests. Let's replete the nutrients, as you described, before we begin to taper. Okay. So even the super gradual tapers that that, uh, a lot of people used They'll be very, very, very careful and cautious, and they might. It might even take them a couple of years. So you're saying instead of doing that, um, take that person and figure out what else is going on. 
But if you've been on you know, SSRI or benzos for many, many years, it is still slow, but we can dramatically minimize these withdrawal symptoms. I mean, the counting the beads and the suffering that people go through is, is not necessary. There's so many people who don't have access to the care you're describing. Um, what, what can be done? Um, cause it, do you have, I'm just curious in the work that you do, uh, do you have a sense of wanting to change the system entirely so that access to alternate therapies and, and modalities and approaches would be easier? So many people wind up prescribed, uh, and I think they wind up on antidepressants after a 10 or 15 minute with uh, meeting with a GP. And it's the easier for the GP to just like write out a script than, and it's, you know, it's more efficient from everybody's standpoint. So how do you correct that? I mean, how do you reach people who are suffering and how are they going to even know that they might have something else going on that makes them predisposed to withdrawal? Well, that's why we're talking and it's going to take, you know, communities and like Mad in America, like Psychiatry Defined and many others. Um, so I don't I don't have the answer. I mean, I think for me in Psychiatry Defined, I, I thought education would be a path. You know, I used to give some of these presentations. Uh, I started in 1990 and I didn't have as much research. So I would it was usually clinical experience or people in my field. But now, in, in 2023, we have the research, so nobody can argue with some of the low cholesterol data or the vitamin D data. So it's a little easier um, with our colleagues now, but it's going to take the uh, you know articulate um, thinking and writing of communities like Madden America and our traditional community in, in mental health to make those changes. I, I do. I am optimistic. I tend to be optimistic. I think some of the younger psychiatrists and, and psych nurse practitioners, they're asking for this information. Why? Because their patients are asking for it. Just like the health and fitness movement, you know, you know, 40 years ago, it was the consumer, right, that started um, pushing that. And now, you know, there are wellness plans. So I believe now the consumer is a little frustrated, the patient, if you will, with this polypharmacy guinea pig approach. They're looking for alternatives. They're coming in to prescribers saying, is there anything else you can do besides the medicine? So there is, you know, a, a movement of people looking. And, you know, we know the, the supplement industry and the health industry is, is, is booming. It's a little disjointed and, and we need our medical colleagues to jump in and, and kind of lead it. In this interview, you've emphasized the science, the science, the science, you know, looking at at these biomarkers and everything, um, that the DSM is basically a construct. So what can that change? <laughs> Does the DSM serve a potentially helpful purpose in some circumstances? And uh, what would you, how would you, <laughs> if you had total power over the DSM, uh, how would you change it? Or would you get rid of it as a psychiatrist? What, what would you do? I mean, I'd probably change my mind every two minutes, but, you know, my first thought is completely useless, right? It's a list of symptoms that um, are, are somewhat meaningless. So that's my, my gut thought. It's really derailed us from looking at etiology and underlying cause. In my world, I have 10, if not 20, unique causes for that individual suffering with that checklist of major depressive disorder. So I'd like to throw it out the, the window, but there is some role in being able to communicate to colleagues, do research, and maybe help a patient understand you are struggling with major depressive disorder. But, but the truth is, it's been a useless concept of just symptoms. And that's not what functional medicine is. Um, we're looking at underlying cause. So in your, in your uh, vision of psychiatry redefined, um, what is what what are your hopes in terms of how practice uh, changes? What's been the response from your colleagues, and uh, how does that feed into how you feel about your mission to to redefine psychiatry? 
you know, I would say 30 years ago, I was tiptoeing around, you know, people would come to see me as the vitamin doctor. And then I ended up in working with eating disorders where it was easy to think and talk and give grand rounds on nutritional deficiencies for our eating sort of patients. But, you know, in the past five years, as the research has exploded on, on from the gut microbiome, you know, to, to vitamin D, I mean, nobody can argue with the science. So there's not a lot of, you know, pushback. It's just um, laziness and learning a new model. And it's also um, trying to break some of the, the hold on a traditional psychopharm model. But when you think about it, it's common sense. We're not kind of uh, looking uh, to disrupt, you know, the the infrastructure. We're just looking to en enhance the model. So when you said, what's the fantasy? The fantasy is every child or adolescent uh, coming to a physician with psychiatric problems, whether it's your PCP or the child psychiatrist, that you get a battery of tests. We're going to rule out celiac disease. We're going to rule out PANDAS. We're going to rule out an infection that could be causing your OCD. I mean, it's tragic that people wait five or 10 years before someone remembering you had a tick bite and all your symptoms started after the tick bite. We're so used to thinking about a, a, a physical symptom or a, a physical deficit as being in, in a box, like it's separate and distinct from... <laughs> what we're going through mentally or emotionally. And, and is part of it, the challenge of taking that more, in, well, integrative, holistic approach where you literally integrate the, the, the pieces of ourselves and how we think about ourselves and how our own conception of what it means to function? I think so. Certainly for, for optimal brain health, I think what has helped is the research on the gut uh, microbiome. I mean, we're all obsessed with our gut and bowels. So over the course of 10 years, the research has exploded. So now people can appreciate what's happening in your gut can affect brain function. We have that science. So then maybe we can appreciate, oh, what's happening in your liver and your kidney and your thyroid. Those all could also affect brain function and depression. Oh, iron deficiency anemia in an adolescent might cause depression. Uh, I mean, the list is endless, but I think it is. It is a mindset. It is thinking holistically. And remembering we have a neck. I don't want to kind of oversimplify the model. And I just want to bring up one, one point is that um, these, um, this functional model, looking at nutritional deficiencies in particular, it just kind of optimizes someone's health, brain health, if you will. It, it doesn't dismiss, which is just so powerful and, and overwhelming in our field, is, is trauma. It doesn't kind of dismiss just the, the, the emotional abuse that is just rampant in our, our kids and adults. So I, I just believe the nutritional kind of optimization just enables people to participate better in psychotherapy, in their healing journey, if they have suffered from trauma or tragedies or losses. So it is not that same single-minded biologic approach that our psychopharm model has kind of disrupted. It is just an adjunct. So we still do a careful history. We still understand who we're talking about, their relationships, their connections, and, and their, their life and their story. And, and maybe medication is needed, maybe it isn't. Oftentimes, if we can get the kids young enough, it's not needed. But the, the Zoloft, the 50 milligrams of Zoloft for that depressed adolescent it's just a Band-Aid that might or might not help. We know it has helped some people, and we know it causes side effects in some people. But it's just that symptomatic potential Band-Aid without ever kind of supporting. And without looking at some of these nutritional deficiencies, if Zoloft did help, it would be very challenging to stop the medication. So the other problem is we're teaching you know, psychiatrists and doctors and nurse practitioners how to prescribe medicines but nobody's teaching them how to stop medicines. I think our goal is to just um, educate. And, and now we have the science and the, and the common sense. And, and we have consumers that are kind of really not going to tolerate just the symptomatic based model any longer. Do you have a message of hope that you convey to 
patients to families to parents of kids with eating disorders or kids with ADHD? Or do you have a message of hope that you convey to them when they come to you in distress? Or do you have a message of hope for our, our listeners? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes in a couple different forms. One, clearly, uh, my message is optimistic and hope. And I think framing this as a biologically based, and we're going to test and look at you, the individual who's struggling, is helpful. Because once we take away the blame, based on if it's a child, an adult, the self-blame, the guilt and the shame, that becomes devastating. So we frame it as a biologically based illness. It's nobody's fault. We're going to look carefully. And then part of that hope is helping people just understand that the human body is based on its ability to change, right? Our, our cells turn over. Some cells turn over every three days, every seven days. So with treatment, we can help you change. And I think that that is the message of hope. And sometimes it takes extra nutritional support. Sometimes it takes looking at some of these environmental factors. Some of it looks at the immune system. It's at times complicating, but there is a model of, of healing. So it is clearly a model of hope because we can use words like recovery and remission in this model. Our current psychiatric model, we don't talk about recovery and remission. Well, Dr. Greenblatt, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, and I appreciate all the work Men in America has done over the years and is doing. And if we can work together with finding solutions, there's a lot more we can do. Our guest today has been author and functional psychiatrist James Greenblatt. For more on his books and his work with functional psychiatry, integrative medicine, and nutrition, see jamesgreenblattmd.com and psychiatryredefined.org. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. For more news, views, and updates, visit maddenamerica.com.